In the name of God, whose gracious love has gathered us here today. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it is a joy, a great joy beyond measure for me to be here with you again today and to be here for this very, very special celebration, 60 years of faithful ministry for the people of St. Margaret's. And it's a joy to welcome those of you from St. Aidan's, the three who will be confirmed and families who are here to support them and to celebrate with you that you just had a 60th anniversary as well. God is good, and God is here. And so are glimpses of the kingdom of heaven, that kingdom which some theologians these days call the kingdom of God, K I N. D-O-M, that realm where we're all kin, where everyone is family. So how do we describe that realm, which we long for, yet is almost impossible to describe? That realm that we long for and yet can scarcely imagine. How do we talk about a reality that is already present, but not yet fully present, a life that we can glimpse sideways from time to time as, as if in a dream that we can't completely remember when we wake up. Well, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. He talked about it not straight on, but sideways through parables. We just heard two of those in our gospel reading. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that's hidden in a field. Well, throughout history, treasure would be buried in a field in time of war. As an invasion approached, People might take all of their most precious things and dig a hole to hide those from armies or from scavengers looking for spoils. Or someone who had collected a whole lot of spoils might bury those with the intention of going back after the war is over to dig them up. We know that in our very own American South, Every once in a while, people who are digging a foundation or doing some other excavation work come across silver that was buried way back in the Civil War. Well, the person in the parable finds a buried treasure of that kind, perhaps while plowing, perhaps while digging a foundation. Knowing what a precious treasure it is, he makes a commitment that changes his life. It changes everything. He sells everything he owns and then spends all of that money to buy the field. That way the treasure will be his without question. And again, Jesus said in the second parable, the kingdom of God is like a merchant in search of pearls. The merchant comes across a pearl, a particular pearl of astounding beauty and value. And like the person who found the treasure, this merchant sells everything, including all of the other pearls in her stock, and buys that one pearl. The merchant makes a commitment that changes her life. Now notice that in both parables, the kingdom of God is not compared to the thing alone. It's not the treasure 
or the pearl in and of itself. Jesus compares the kingdom of God to the action of making a commitment and changing your life for the sake of the most wonderful and valuable things you can imagine. And Jesus teaches us that that pearl of great price, that thing, that wonder for which we make our commitment and change our lives is life. Life in all of its fullness. Life more alive than we've ever known before. Abundant life in the presence of God and in the presence of community with God's loved ones. Living in the kingdom of God requires making a commitment, changing your life, willingly even suffering loss in order to gain what is most important. Well, today you who are about to be confirmed or received into the Episcopal Church, or to reaffirm your faith, you are making a commitment today, a commitment that through the grace of God will change your lives. I wonder what you will lose in this journey, what you willingly choose to sacrifice. Maybe your identity as a member of another church in the past. Maybe what felt like freedom when you lived without a commitment to God and to a faith community. Whatever losses you might feel today as you make this commitment, I pray and I feel certain that the joy the joy of publicly affirming your faith and becoming a committed member of a faith community, that joy will wash away every sense of loss or worry. The people of St. Margaret's have experienced loss after loss in your 60-year journey. You've worshipped in four different buildings across 60 years in four different places. Now, we church people get mighty attached to our buildings. <laughs> and of course we do, because we're incarnate. We're in the flesh. And our flesh and our spirit need places to be. As you and St. Margaret's have had to move from one place to another, you've experienced loss. And you've also experienced tremendous gains because maybe, just maybe, your sacred cows are not as sacred as they would have been had you been in just one building for 60 years. Maybe, just maybe, you've learned to be flexible and responsive and ready to pick up and go whenever the Spirit calls. New people of St. Margaret's have experienced betrayals, the division of nearly 60 years ago that exiled you from your church home, the shock of embezzlement, the frustration of tensions over relations with your neighbor and with diocesan leadership, frustrations about the condition in which this building had been left when you inherited it and moved in. You've had more than your fair share, much more than your fair share of trials in 60 years. And through it all, as I've witnessed and known you, you have labored faithfully to make commitments and to change your lives, to know the greater treasures to hold on to the pearl of great price. You have chosen community with God and with one another. The challenges that you have faced, endured, and overcome live right at the heart of who you are, 
right there in the heart where Jesus also lives with healing grace and abounding love. As the last line of the hymn we just sang a few moments ago says, the last line of the verse that we didn't sing, servants well done. And as you know, the journey's not over. In fact, the next 60 years are just starting. So as you step into the next 60 years, what commitments will you make? How will your lives be changed yet again? As you step into this next chapter, I encourage you to be intentional about growing in trust. Trust in God and trust in one another more fully than you've ever known so far. Because a common, very human response to challenges of the kinds that you've faced is to hunker down in guarded suspicion in order to shield yourself from being betrayed again. It's a natural thing to do. The problem is that a shield against betrayal also creates a barrier to trust and to the deeper joy that comes with trusting God and one another. The good news is that we can grow in trust. You can go, grow in trust in God and in one another. And your patron, St. Margaret, can show you how. So Margaret, as you may remember, faced trials and challenges. Just to summarize it very quickly, she was born in Hungary when her family was in exile from England. When she was 11 or 12, her family returned to England, but they were only there some years before they had to flee in the face of the Norman invasion of 1066. At that time, they boarded a ship with the intention of going back to Hungary, but there was a storm that blew the ship north, and they were shipwrecked in Scotland. Well, the king of Scotland, King Malcolm III, gave them refuge. Eventually, Margaret married that king. Together, they had eight children, three of whom became monarchs of England. In 1093, Malcolm and the oldest son were killed in an attack, and Margaret, who was in her late 40s, died soon afterwards in her profound grief. Through the exile and the challenges, Margaret lived a deep faith and a deep abiding hope. Margaret knew hope and trust through prayer. Medieval writers wrote of her that she had set hours of prayer every day and that she slept little in order to have more time for prayer. Historians write that her devotion to prayer was so strong, so profound, that it began to affect her husband, King Malcolm who had previously known B for his, his coarse and vulgar nature and for his volatile temper. temper. Well, influenced by Margaret's prayerful nature, he grew to be more faithful and trusting. Prayer led Margaret to a life of direct-on, hands-on service to the poor. Stories of her life said that she would get up at midnight in order to pray the earliest service of the day with a group of monks. And poor men and women and children would wait for her. And after the service, every day, she would choose six of them and she would wash their feet and then she would give them alms. 
and the same thing the next day with another six. She got down on her hands and knees to serve the poor. Prayer and service to others shaped the life of St. Margaret, who is called the Pearl of Scotland. We grow in trust in God and in one another by following that example, by dedicating ourselves to prayer and service. Because in doing that, we make our lives not about ourselves, but about God and about others. We are still in the equation, but we're not the first figure. We make a commitment that changes our lives and helps us live more fully than ever in the kingdom of God. So continue today. Those of you from both congregations that are here, continue every day in prayer. Ask God to help you to pray. Ask God to help you to trust more fully than ever before, to trust in God and to trust in the community of faith and to trust your own heart. Ask God to show it is, to show you who it is that you're called to serve in direct hands-on ministry in this next chapter of your faith story. Don't be afraid to make commitments that change your life for the sake of the kingdom because those commitments steer you right toward that treasure that you seek. They steer you to the pearl of great price, the kingdom of God for which we so long. May it be so, and may God make it so. Amen. Amen.